Trinity Sunday, that day when, I heard a laugh, yes, thank you, that day when the language of our prayer soars and feels a little incomprehensible, and it's always a fool's errand for any preacher to try to preach on this. The collect prays, you have given to us, your servants, grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. You have given to us. The collect assumes we already have the capacity to spot the trinity, to see its majesty, and to see the oneness within it. It's comforting that the collect has so much faith in us, But I'm guessing a lot of us feel that vote of confidence may not be warranted. The proper preface that we'll pray later always starts with thanksgiving. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And then moves to proclaim, for with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, You are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons, and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. One God, one Lord, trinity of persons, unity of being. The three is one, the one is three, and my accountant's brain hurts because how does that math work? But that's the first mistake we make when we come to the Trinity. We try to understand it with our left brain, our analytical brain. We try to understand it with our rational brain. These are great parts of our wonderful minds, but they don't serve us well on a day like today. Now we've got to drop down into that intuitive wisdom that lives deep in our heart space, that can feel the truth of this mystery even if we can't fully understand it or comprehend it. This isn't so much a truth that we master with our minds as it is a reality we lay back and float in. It holds us up. It is the water in which we swim. It is the air we breathe. Its imprint is everywhere, if we just have eyes to see. Our first lesson from Genesis 1 dials us into the God who creates all that is. The story is so familiar and so long that we forget what it is actually proclaiming. God creates everything and calls it good. And at the end, when God surveys all of creation with all the wonderfully wild diversity of creatures dancing throughout it, God calls it very good. This isn't a story of God producing creation, cranking out creatures on an assembly line. No, in this story, God is a creator. Talk to any artist or creator, or musician, or gardener, or cook, or craftsperson, or any other kind of maker you can imagine. And they will tell you that creating is an intimate activity. You pour yourself into your creation. It carries your mark, your imprint. It carries a piece of you. God pours God's self into this act of creation, and God's fingerprints are all over it. 2 Corinthians continues weaving in threes. Paul writes, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. We're not in prose land here. We're in poetry. In an act of total grace, God pours the fullness of God's self into our human flesh in the Son. God forever wed to our humanity, 
forever wed to our flesh, forever bound to our limitations, forever calling forth our incredible capacity to love, forever calling our divine DNA to come out of the shadows and show its face in acts of compassion and solidarity and service. And God moves like a flame, setting our passions ablaze in wonderfully unique ways. Spirit weaving us together in a great communion, blowing where it will on its own terms, that are often annoyingly generous as it defies the boundaries and barriers, the constructs and categories that we human beings have erected. And Matthew 28 brings us home. Jesus tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hierarchy is flattened here. Nothing is held back from Jesus. All authority on heaven and on earth has given to him, and he passes it all on to us, commanding us to go amidst all the diverse peoples and nations of the earth, teaching his nonviolent, radical way of love. After all, everything that Jesus commanded those disciples is summed up in the great commandment. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And as they go, they and we are to remember that his presence is with us always. So as all these images swirl around us today, how might they illuminate the Trinity? What truth is the Trinity trying to reveal to us, trying to get us to see? Well, first, God in God's very nature loves diversity, loves uniqueness, loves variety, and God loves communion. God loves to be in relationship. God loves to dance. Parachoresis, the Greek word meaning the circle dance. This was the very first word the early church theologians used to describe the Trinity. All of this variety, all of this particularity, all of this uniqueness, God has included it all in God's very being. It all belongs Think about that. Call to mind someone who is so unbelievably and maddeningly different from you. Think about how their particularity gets under your skin. This can be someone you know personally or some anonymous someone who represents all that you cannot abide. Can you see them in your mind's eye? They are included in this dance, just as you are. If we really take this to heart, if we really believe this, how does it change how we view those people whom we just don't understand at all? How does this change how we treat those who are standing across the great chasm from us? How does this change how we interact with those who just seem like they're from a different planet? If we start from the place of understanding that they are included inside the circle, and in fact that this circle only knows how to expand, including everything in and pulling it back to the love that only welcomes. If we start from understanding that they are included in this circle, How might Trinity guide us and help us heal all the divides that are ripping us apart as a society and as a people? 
We talk about the fruits of the Spirit in the church. But what are the fruits of the Trinity? What are the qualities that it lifts up before us? Again, in the Trinity, there is no hierarchy. There is no power over. There is only power with. And so its fruits are mutuality, reciprocity, equality, respect, the capacity to yield, the capacity to give, and just as important, the ability to receive, creativity, spontaneity, playfulness, lightness. What would happen if we manifested these gifts? How might these qualities change how we approach others? How might these qualities qualities change how we steward power? Within the Trinity lies the key to unlock the mystery of how we are to get along in this world, not in spite of our differences, but by allowing them to be the very teachers we need to drop down into a deeper communion that presses all the way to the very center of creation until we can see how that other belongs and is included no less than we. Can you imagine living out of a sense of communion that could go that deep? Could you imagine how this could transform our world and reveal our conflicts as the straw men of the ego that they are? Can you imagine how much richer our lives would be if we could honor and celebrate our differences and refuse to seed away our communion at the same time? God wants this kind of world for us. God created this kind of world for us and for all of creation. God redeemed this kind of world for us and for all creation. God continues to weave this kind of world together for us and for all creation. Today, the God who is Trinity invites us to drop all of our defenses to keep us from joining hands in this cosmic dance, as Thomas Merton used to call it, and to lay claim to our deepest yearning that we long for this kind of world too. Don't miss the chance to join in this dance ever.